So in section 18.3, you see a bunch of different reactions uh, through the enol and enolate. Um, so all of the reaction mechanisms are going to start with the formation of an enol or an enolate. So keep that in mind. Our first reaction is called racemization. Now you've seen the first part of this word before, right? We remember the concept of a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is um, a mixture in which you have two enantiomers in a 50-50% uh, ratio. Racemization is when you take one compound, uh, one enantiomer of a compound, and going through the enol form, you create a racemic mixture. So you may be wondering, how does that work? That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Well, our initial compound, the R form in this case, has an sp3 hybridized carbon um, as the alpha carbon. Now, if it's put into acid or base, it's going to go through the enol, enolate form, through tautomerization. So remember, these are going back and forth in equilibrium. And when we do that, this carbon becomes an sp2 carbon. Now, hopefully this kind of rings a bell. Um, you may recall that when you learned about SN1 chemistry, we said that the product was usually a racemic mixture. And that's because our intermediate was a carbocation, which is also sp2 hybridized. That means this carbon is trigonal planar, it's flat. So um, when it goes to pick up a hydrogen again to continue the tautomerization process back to the keto form, that hydrogen can add from the front or from the back. And that's going to give you two different forms. If it adds from what we're perceiving as the back, that's going to give you the S form. And if it adds from what we are perceiving as the front, that's going to give you the original R form. Now, since these processes are in equilibrium, they're going to keep going back and forth until they've reached an equilibrium. And then at this point, tautomerization is still occurring, but neither enantiomer is going to be prevalent. Um, this is actually kind of a dangerous process. Um, if you are taking any sort of um, drug into your body, and one enantiomer is effective and the other one is not, or one enantiomer is effective and okay for you and the other one is actually harmful, uh, you don't want to use that drug or put it into the market because our bodies are water and different areas of our body are acidic or basic and these drugs are going to go through the process of tautomerization. So you have to make sure that a drug that has um, that potential for racemization would be safe in that situation. Uh, this also has the potential to create some pretty cool processes in uh, bicyclic compounds. So if you're starting off with a compound that is cis, such as in this situation, when this ketone goes through the process of tautomerization, uh, you have a 50-50 shot of this hydrogen ending up back in the cis position or creating a trans compound. So for that reason, uh, typically when you have a ketone, one removed from the joint of a bicyclic compound, you're gonna see racemization. Uh, so decalone is a really good example of this. So while racemization really comes across more as like an effect of tautomerization, uh, there are actual reactions that occur at the alpha carbon, and that's what we're going to talk about from here on out. The first one being halogenation at the alpha carbon, which is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to take an alpha hydrogen and replace it with a halogen. And uh, like I said earlier, this process is going to start off going through an enol or an enolate. Let's pretend we are in base conditions here, and we pull off our hydrogen creating our enolate, and then we add in our halogen. The enolate is going to attack and kick out the other equivalent of the halogen, which will then 
pick up a proton. And that gives us our alpha halogenation. Now the haliform reaction is kind of what happens when this is on steroids. So you add in a massive excess of your halogen and an excess of base, and you end up replacing all three of the, car of the uh, alpha halogens, whoa, alpha hydrogens, sorry, that were on the alpha carbon. Uh, you'll replace all of these with a halogen atom, creating a carbon that has these three on there. Just gonna mean this is very partially positive and now a decent leaving group. So when the hydroxide comes in and attacks again, now it's going to attack our carbonyl carbon instead of removing an alpha hydrogen. Now when that carbonyl reforms, we're gonna kick out CX3. And through some proton transfers, we'll end up with a carboxylate and a halo form. Uh, so for example, you've seen chloroform before, uh, just depending on what halogen is subbed in there. This would be bromoform, and you can also have iodoform, and the general term is just halo form. Our next reaction is the hell volhard zelinsky reaction, and this one's really bizarre. It's cool. So uh, this is how you would synthesize an alpha halo carboxylic acid. So in this reaction, you take a carboxylic acid, react it with an equivalent of a halogen, a molecular halogen, and phosphorus, and then you follow that up with water. Um, so what you may notice is that the alpha hydrogen has been replaced with the halogen. And you're probably wondering, well, that doesn't make sense. How could I pull off the alpha hydrogen? This one is so much more acidic. You're right, that one is so much more acidic, but that's not the process that this goes through. If you look at the intermediate, we start off with our carboxylic acid, and then by reaction with bromine and phosphorus, this may kind of give you um, a recollection of something like this, we're actually going to end up making an acid halide. And then we can pull off the alpha hydrogen and replace it with a halogen. Now, hopefully you also remember that acid halides are the most reactive of the carboxylic acid derivatives. So if my acid halide is reacted with water, I'm going to hydrolyze my acid halide back to a carboxylic acid. Um, so really cool reaction. And as you can imagine, uh, an alpha halo carboxylic acid is synthetic gold. Think of all the really cool things that you could do now that you have a halogen here. You could replace it with any nucleophile you could think of, and that nucleophile would not be interested in this because carboxylic acids are not that um, receptive to nucleophilic attack. Now, there are also other ways to synthesize alpha halo carboxylic acids. One way would be to use an n halo succinamide and a trace amount of a halogen acid um, in order to produce, uh, you could do this with alpha chloro and alpha bromo um, acyl chlorides, which could then be hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid. So, for example, um, you take an acyl chloride and add in molecular iodine, trace amounts of hydriodic acid in the presence of thionyl chloride, just so you keep this chlorine there, and you're going to end up putting an iodine on the alpha carbon, which could then be hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid if you wanted to. Now, the reason this is so important is that we can do some cool stuff with this. Uh, we could react in the presence of base, and we could displace the halogen, giving us an alpha hydroxy acid, which we looked at a couple chapters ago. And we talked about how um, alpha hydroxy acids are having a really big moment in the cosmetics industry. Um, or you could add in an amine, which could also 
displace the bromine. And then you have an extra equivalent of the amine there to deprotonate this form and create that guy.